So my name is Kevin Clues. I'm from NVIDIA. And my colleague Alexei Fomenko here from Intel. We're going to be giving a joint talk on Device Plugins 2.0, how to build a driver for dynamic resource allocation, otherwise known as DRA. So what exactly is dynamic resource allocation? Well, it's a new way of requesting access to resources available in Kubernetes 126 and beyond. It provides an alternative to the count-based interface of, for example, asking for uh, nvidia.com slash GPU2. And using this alternative um, interface, it puts full control of the API to request resources in the hands of third-party party developers. So if you, you know, if you have simple devices, you can continue to use the existing device plugin interface. But for more complex devices, this new mechanism exists to give you a much more powerful interface. Um, one can think of dynamic resource allocation as sort of a generalization of the persistent volume API for all types of resources, not just volumes. And the key concepts that you want to have in mind when you're thinking about dynamic resource allocation is that of the resource class and its associated class parameters, which help you define the API for resource classes, as well as resource claims and resource claim templates uh, and their associated claim parameters, which I'll go into a little bit more detail as we go through the talk. So before I talk about those, though, I want to just go through a really quick example and show you, you know, demonstrate kind of how you would move from a user's perspective of requesting access to a device via the traditional device plugin API and what that uh, same request would look like under DRA. So in a traditional device plugin, if you were to ask for a, a single GPU, under your limits section of your resources um, uh, spec in your, in your pod spec, you could ask for something like nvidia.com slash GPU1, and you would get access to that GPU at runtime. Um, under dynamic resource allocation, um, that a similar, uh, a, um, uh, similar allocation would be, would be done using um, what you see here on the right. So the things to note here are that I have this object, this separate object for my pod called a resource claim template. Inside that resource claim template, I give reference to a specific resource class. In this case, the resource class name is called uh, gpu.nvidia.com. And this is something that's associated with the driver that I'm going to you know, talk through today how you can develop one of these. But this name gets associated with your driver, is installed by the cluster admin, and is kind of analogous to um, the resource type that you have from the device plugins of nvidia.com slash GPU on the left. Um, once you have this resource claim template in place, you can now, in your pod spec, there's a new section called resource claims where you can refer back to the name of that resource claim template, create a local name for your various containers within your pod to reference that, and then put that under, underneath a new claim section in your, in your resources spec for your container. And once you've done that, the driver under the hood will you know, kick in to allocate a GPU for your, for your container, and when your container comes up, you'll have access to that GPU. Um, if you then expanded this to where on the existing device plugin API, you were to request two GPUs, on the right, that would basically be referring to this claim template multiple times, having different local names for those, um, for the GPUs that you want to access, and then, you know, plugging those into the actual claim section of your container um, to get access to the GPUs that, that, rep that are represented by that. <clears throat> so, with that kind of simple example in place, obviously that's not, you know, it's, a, it's much more verbose than you have with the existing device plugin API. So, the, you know, the obvious question is, well, why would I want to do things this way? And I hope by the end of this talk you'll be convinced that, that this dynamic resource allocation way of getting access to these types of resources is much more powerful. Um, so, yeah, so, you know, the first concept that I talked about is this notion of a resource class. And a resource class basically associates a named resource with its corresponding resource driver. So if you remember from the last slide, the, the resource class that I defined was called gpu.nvidia.com. And the driver that I would install on my, on my machine to, 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 to be able to allocate uh, resource classes of type gpu.nvidia.com, in this case, would have the name gpu.resource.nvidia.com. Um, along with these resource classes, though, which is something different than what you can do with, with Persistent Volumes API, is you can associate a uh, optional class parameters object, which has a completely custom API that's up to you as the resource driver developer to, to, to define what this looks like. And so in the case of NVIDIA GPUs, this is actually a real claim class parameters object that we have for the driver that we built for GPUs. Um, you can set up something like saying that uh, any GPUs that are allocated by this resource class cannot be shared. So if you want to make sure that you have exclusive access to the GPU versus multiple people, you know, referencing this resource uh, type and you don't want them to share access to it, if, you, if the admin decides to install this class parameters object along with his resource class, it'll limit that sh sharing capability. Now moving on to resource claims, this is kind of the, the user side analogous thing to the resource class, where the resource claim represents the actual resource allocation to be made by a resource driver 
as defined by the, by the end user, right? They create these objects, they refer to the resource classes that they want to allocate resources for, and then when they're referenced inside the pod, these resources um, get injected into it at runtime. Where the main difference between a resource claim template and a resource claim is that resource claim templates create a new resource claim on the fly each time that they are referenced. And so, you know, from the example I had before, the, the end result of this in the case of GPUs is that you, you get a unique GPU for each reference to one of these resource claim templates. On the flip side, if you have a resource claim that's not a template, it, re it always refers to the exact same uh, object anytime you refer to it, which basically enables you to have shared access to a GPU for each reference. Um, so just as with resource cl uh, classes, resource claims can include an optional set of claim parameters with whatever custom API you've decided to define for your resource type. So for NVIDIA GPUs, um, one of the cl claim parameters objects that we've created is called GPU claim parameters, where the example that I'm showing here is basically letting you say, okay, whenever someone asks for, uh, or when, I'm, when I create a claim that wants to access a GPU, um, in this example, I can say, okay, that GPU has to either be of the product family T4 or a V100 with less than or equal to 16 gigabytes of memory on it, right? So it lets you kind of selectively dive in and more precisely ask for the type of GPU that you, that you want to get access to. Additionally, you can specify, you know, extended parameters such as what stra sharing strategy you might want to enable for uh, the resource once it's been granted to you. So NVIDIA GPUs have a couple different sharing strategies you can use. One is time slicing, one is MPS, which allows you to, you know, further subdivide the memory that you have um, amongst different clients that are sharing access to the GPU. And you can specify all of this as part of this custom claim parameters object that, you know, we've defined as part of our um, API for accessing GPUs with DRA. Um, so assuming, yeah, that you had one of these uh, claims created with the name shared GPU, I can reference that in my pod spec, and then multiple containers within that pod can reference that exact same uh, claim and get shared access to that underlying GPU. And it's not limited to within a pod, you can do the same thing across pods. As long as you've created this, this resource claim as a global object, you reference it, now uh, different containers from different pods can access that same GPU. Now one thing I don't have on the slides, but it's probably worth mentioning is that we do, uh, resource claims are isolated to a specific namespace, so you can't share these GPUs across different namespaces. Once a resource claim exists in one namespace, the pods that are running have to be in that same namespace in order to access uh, the resource claims that are being created as part of it, as a security measure. Okay, so kind of walking through those simple examples, the goal of this talk is really to teach you how to write your own DRA resource driver in order to enable similar features on your own custom resources, right? It's, it's great that we've, you know, taken the initiative, built this initial driver for, for NVIDIA GPUs, but I really wanna, you know, enable, you know, third-party developers for whatever devices that you guys might wanna make available to be able to do something similar. Um, yeah, so with that, the outline of the rest of the talk is that I'm basically gonna walk through the anatomy of one, what one of these DRA resource drivers looks like and how they work under the hood. I'm then gonna walk through the process of what it takes to actually allocate a resource um, using DRA, what, what happens behind the scenes once you create a resource claim and uh, the resource that you're asking for finally gets injected into your container and you have access to it. And then I'm gonna walk through the process of some helper libraries uh, that we have um, to teach you how to build one of these resource drivers and what functions and methods you need to implement in order to um, make your resources available in a similar way. Then I'm gonna hand it over to Alexa, who's gonna talk about some of the new and upcoming features that, um, are, that, that we're building in, in relation to DRA and end with a demo both on NVIDIA GPUs and Intel GPUs to show the flexibility of this across different resource types. Okay, so what does one of these uh, DRA resource drivers look like? Well, at, at its core, it, it basically consists of two separate but coordinating components. You have a centralized controller that's running somewhere in your cluster with high availability, and then you have a node local kubelet plugin that's running it as a daemon set on the nodes that, where the resources themselves actually need to be advertised and eventually prepared for use. Um, the centralized controller, its job is basically to coordinate with the Kubernetes scheduler to decide which nodes an incoming resource claim can actually be serviced on. Um, once it's made that decision, it performs the actual uh, resource claim allocation after the schedulers pick the node where that, you know, resource, where that pod should actually land to, to get access to that resource. And then, you know, once everything's done, it will perf perform the deallocation of the resource claim once it gets deleted at some point in the future. Uh, on the other side, the node local kubit plugin, its job is to basically adver advertise any node local state that the centralized controller will need in order to make any allocation decisions at runtime. Um, 
also, once those allocations have been made, it will then perform any node local operations that are re required as part of preparing or unpreparing the resource claim. And we'll go through a couple of examples later on of what, what this might entail, rather than just, you know, device not, might not just be already ready to go. You might have to, you know, set up some parameters on it, um, depending on what the actual resource claim coming in looks like. Um, and then once it's done that, its job is to pass the devices associated with that prepared resource claim to the kubelet so that it can eventually forward them on to the underlying container runtime and make those resources available uh, to the running container. So I talked about, you know, these two pieces obviously need to be able to communicate in some manner, right? Centerage controller makes allocation decisions. Kubelet plugin tells it what resources are available so that it can make those allocation decisions. And so there's, you know, there's a couple different ways that this communication could happen. Um, for the purposes of this talk, I'm focusing mostly on, on this first one, which is kind of a single all-purpose per node CRD, which can exist in your cluster, where the Kubelet plugin will advertise all available resources that it has. The centralized controller will track <coughs> any resources that it's allocated in the same CRD, and then the Kubelet plugin um, will also track any resources it prepares uh, inside the CRD. So there's, from one CRD, you can get the full view of everything that's associated with this driver in terms of what's available, how things have been allocated, and what's actually, you know, been set up on the node for, for someone to get access to. Um, alternatively, you don't have to do it this way. You could have some sort of split purpose communication where, you know, the Kubelet plugin might still advertise its, its available resources for a CRD, via CRD, so that the centralized controller has an easy way to, 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 to access these. But then the centralized controller might actually um, track all of its, re its, its uh, allocated resources down through this um, field that we have in the resource claim itself called a resource handle. It might not need to be something that's stored in the CRD, accessible via the API server um, for, 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 for making things a bit more efficient. And then at the code, uh, at the Kubelet level, instead of using a CRD where you might have, you know, constant conflicts when you're writing back and forth to it across these different components, instead you can just checkpoint the state on a, uh, in a file on the node local file system, so long as the Kubelet plugin has a way to, to track this over time. Um, but like I said, we're gonna focus, at least for the purpose of this talk, on this single all-purpose one, just because it's easier to talk about if it's all in one place. Um, and what this might actually look like under the hood is that the Kubelet plugin, when it first comes online, it'll advertise some set of allocatable devices that the controller at some point in the future could allocate. When the centralized controller is triggered to do an allocation, it could pick one of those devices, write some information back to the CRD about what GPU has been allocated to a specific claim, and then once the Kubelet plugin kicks in and prepares this claim for use, it can also write this back to the CRD saying, okay, you allocated that and now I have prepared it for use before it gets passed off to the um, container that gets started later on. So what does this process actually look like? So how do we actually allocate a resource using one of these drivers? Well, there's two modes of operation for this. One is called immediate and one is called delayed or wait for uh, first consumer, where the main difference between them is that with immediate allocation, and this is something you can specify in your, in your resource claim as you create it um, as an object in the cluster. Um, and with immediate allocation, as soon as you create this resource claim, that's going to trigger your, your resource driver to allocate it on some node somewhere in the cluster, independent of what pods might actually try and come along later to, to access it. And the pods that do reference that claim will end up being restricted to the nodes where those allocations have been made. So it's a bit more restrictive in the sense that you don't know where these pods, what other resource constraints they might have. So doing an immediate allocation is really a means to say, I know that any time that some pod references it, I want it to be on this specific node. Whereas the del delayed allocation delays the allocation of the resource claim until the first pod that references it is being scheduled. And there's analogous things in the persistent volumes API. So for those of you that are familiar with that, this might um, not seem too foreign. Um, and when you do the delayed style allocation, uh, resource availability will be considered as part of that overall pod scheduling decision for the first one that, that accesses it. And we're gonna focus, because it's the more complicated one, we're gonna focus on the delayed one for, uh, as I walk through the process of allocating a resource using a DRA driver. Um, so assuming that the sysadmin has come along, he's deployed his DRA resource driver, um, got his centralized controller set up, daemon sets running with the kubelet plugins. He's also installed some resource class that, um, you know, enables someone to come along and create a resource claim that references a specific uh, resource type that that driver knows how to service. Um, a user can then come along, create one of these claims, create a pod that, that references that resource class, create a pod that then references one of those resource claims, um, which is then gonna trigger the Kubernetes scheduler to actually see that pod and start the scheduling process, right? When it does that, 
it's going to generate a list of potential nodes where it thinks that, you know, where it, where it knows that it could potentially put that pod independent of, of the, the resource driver giving it inf any information at this point about, you know, where this resource itself can actually be allocated. And when it does that, it creates a new API server object um, called a pod scheduling context, which the centralized controller is able to pick up and see this list of generated potential nodes and help modify that and you know, trim down to the point where an actual scheduling decision can be made. So once the centralized controller picks up this list of uh, generated potential nodes, it will narrow down that list of nodes to the ones where it knows it can allocate the resource associated with this resource claim. It'll write that narrowed down list back to the pod scheduling context, who will then be picked up by the Kubernetes scheduler to help you know, figure out which node we should actually uh, allocate this, uh, this or schedule this pod on. And this process could end up completing, uh, um, repeating over and over again until the actual uh, node has been found where this resource is able to be, to be allocated. Um, but once that is found, the Kubernetes scheduler will select a node, write that back to the pod scheduling context, which will be picked up by the centralized controller, who then goes through the process of actually allocating the claim, knowing that this is the node where that resource needs to be made available. It writes that allocation back to the resource claim object that then gets picked up by the Kubernetes scheduler, who does the pod scheduling, writes the node name back to the pod where that, um, where, where that pod has been scheduled, which then through the normal processes that already exist will be picked up by the kubelet, who then will call into the, um, the kubelet plugin associated with your driver, passing all the claim information associated with that resource claim to it, who will then generate a list of, uh, of what we call CDI devices, which it can then pass on to the container runtime will then start your container with access to the resources that your driver has allocated. So it's kind of, there's a lot of back and forth going on, but most of this is hidden from you. And we, as I mentioned, we have helper libraries that abstract a lot of this out, so you don't have to worry about all this coordination back and forth across all of these components. Um, now, you know, I said we're gonna focus on delayed allocation, but it's worth looking just really quickly at what immediate allocation would look like. So assuming you had a user that came along, created a resource claim referencing a resource class, as I mentioned before, the minute you create this claim, that's going to trigger the centralized controller to make this allocation on some node in the cluster. So that at some point in the future, when the, when the user comes along, creates a pod, that's gonna get picked up by the Kubernetes scheduler, and now he's gonna use the information about where that resource claim has been allocated to make his scheduling decision to trigger that whole process on the right again. Okay, so that in a nutshell, it's a long, complicated process in many ways, but you know, the rest of this talk is now dedicated to knowing that, that that background information about how all of this happens. How do you actually build one of these resource drivers yourself, right? And so this slide here, if, if, you, if you take nothing else away from this talk and you guys want to build a resource driver, this is the slide to remember because we've created an example resource driver that we've you know, put as a, a repo underneath uh, the Kubernetes SIG uh, organization on GitHub that has an example of all of this. It provides a fully functional DRA resource driver on a set of mock GPUs. It wraps everything in a Helm chart so you can easily deploy it. It provides scripts for bringing up a kind cluster to test all of this in a multi-node setup. And it runs on Mac and Linux without requiring any specialized hardware, right? So you can clone this repo, run a couple scripts, see the demo running, and then dig into the details yourself to kind of tinker around with it and figure out how everything works. Um, and the readme itself includes a demo with four example deployments that, that you can see here that are mostly revolve around how do you enable some of these sharing capabilities uh, given that you have resource claims at your disposal now. Um, and yeah, like I said, we encourage you to fork this project and, and play around with it yourself. Um, but in a nutshell, what it takes to actually build your own uh, DRA resource driver is you want to decide on a name for your driver. In our case, in the example so far, I've been talking about you know, gpu.nvidia.com, but in your case, you would come up with some name for the driver for the resource type that you're trying to advertise. You would then need to decide on a communication strategy, whether you're gonna, you're gonna use a single purpose CRD like I've been showing up until now, or some combination of the split purpose communication, um, which was presented earlier as well. Um, then you're gonna need to define some types to represent your allocatable resources, your allocated resources and, and your prepared resources so they can be tracked on these three different levels. Um, you also then need to define some types to represent your class parameters you want for your resources and any claim parameters that you want to define the API for accessing your resources. Um, you should prepare at least one default resource class for distribution with your resource driver. So in the case of GPUs, we have that one resource class called gpu.nvidia.com that you then access through the claim parameters object, which can help you dig in to, to get a GPU type that you actually want. 
Um, you, there's then boilerplate code you can pull into your project to register your controller with the scheduler. There's boilerplate code you can pull in to register your Kublet uh, plugin with the Kublet. And then, the fun part, you sit down and you write the business logic for your controller and your Kublet plugin. And that's what I'm going to focus on today because this is, you know, where um, the particulars of your specific driver come in. Um, that where you're going to need to, you know, implement the logic for, for, for how you make your resources available. And we provide a couple of helper libraries to make this a little bit easier. So the first one is the controller helper library. And its job is to kind of abs abstract this whole communication between the scheduler and this coordination back and forth to how, to, to, to where you have to, you know, figure out what node you want your allocation to, to land on. That all happens behind the scenes. And we provide a driver interface um, with five functions that you need to implement. And as long as you implement these five functions, behind the scenes, the rest of the library code will make sure that, um, yeah, all of, all of that talking to the scheduler and making sure that you, um, uh, you know, eventually do the allocation at the proper point in the, in the life cycle of the claim is, is abstracted behind all of these function calls. And so I'm just going to walk through each of these one by one. So. Um, the first set are the uh, get class parameters and get claim parameters functions. And these are the, the easy ones to implement in many ways. Once you've defined your class parameters and your claim parameter object types, the only thing that, you're, that these functions do is basically give you a, an API into, um, uh, or a hook into a point where you can say, okay, I see that for the specific class or claim, there's a claim parameters uh, reference uh, specified inside it. And this gives me the opportunity to pull that reference uh, the actual object associated with that reference down from the API server and then return it through this interface object that's the return type from these functions. And what that basically does is it makes these objects now available in all of the other calls without you having to re-pull that from the API server every time. Um, the second one is the unsuitable nodes function. Um, this, is, this function is the one that kind of sits behind the scenes during this whole loop with the scheduler back and forth about deciding which node you actually want a allocation to be, or a pod to be scheduled on to, to, to satisfy the allocation that you're trying to make. Um, and what you basically do in the body of this function is that you need to loop through the potential nodes that you're passed in search of available resources on those nodes, and then write back this narrowed down list of nodes where the resources are unavailable into this claim allocation struct that gets passed to you, right? And so you can imagine that, you know, there's a whole bunch of nodes, there's a whole bunch of claims associated with the pod you're trying to launch, and you just need to write that logic to figure out where these resources can actually be made available for that pod. Um, the next call is allocate. So this is the call that gets um, invoked uh, as part of the, 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 you know, the, the process that you see on the bottom here on, with delayed on the left and immediate on the right. So once the scheduler has actually selected a node and the centralized controller is triggered to make an allocation, this is the function that you implement to, to, to define the logic for how that allocation actually happens, right? And you end up writing that information back to the, the CRD if you're using the centralized um, uh, CRD approach for communication. Um, and yeah, associated with that is the, the return type here of, uh, of an allocation result, which has a field inside of it called a, a resource handle, which is just some, some set of opaque data attached to the claim that can be passed back to the kublet for arbitrary interpretation, right? So you can think of this as basically just a, a, a long string that, uh, that, is, that Kubernetes doesn't know anything about, and it's just a way for your controller to communicate with your kublet plugin, and he can interpret this, this data however, however he wants. Um, and then obviously the last one is, is the deallocate call. So once the deallocate, uh, once the claim itself gets deleted, deallocate will be triggered and you can clean up anything that you've done from your, from your allocate call. Um, and that was all on the controller side. So now on the, on the Kublet plugin side, there's basically two, um, two components that you need to be aware of. One is a helper library, which lets you set up registration and actually get your Kublet plugin talking to the Kublet uh, to begin with. And then there is the Kublet plugin API, which defines two calls, node prepare resource and node unprepare resource. Um, and uh, under the hood, the, you know, they're, they're, they're fairly straightforward. When you get a node prepare resource request call coming in, you have all of the information associated with the claim that you're supposed to prepare the resource for. And you do that, you take that information, and at the end of the day, you need to pass back a set of CDI devices. And, you know, uh, I keep throwing this term around CDI devices without really defining it. It's a bit out of scope to, to, to talk through what CDI devices are, but it's a CNCF sponsored project for um, standardizing on how 
devices can be made available to uh, containers. And we leverage that in this DRA project. And it becomes kind of the foundational piece for how you actually make these resources available at the end of the day. And I encourage you to look up CDI, uh, Container Device Interface, um, to learn more about this. But it also is built into this example driver that I have. So if you just go into the code and look at it, um, it should be pretty self-explanatory how it works from there. Um, yeah, and then on the last call, unprepared resource request, you get a similar um, struct passed to you with the claim information that you can use to undo uh, any preparation that you've made um, via the prepare call. Yeah, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to Alexa, who's going to talk about some of the new and upcoming features with, uh, with, with, with the, the DRE resource drivers in general. Thanks, Kevin. Hi, all. So what you have just heard was available since the last release 126. And in the release that we have received last week, 127, we have a new improvement of the dynamic resource allocation. In particular, it is possible now to create a custom resource, con resource drivers uh, and controllers to allocate several kinds of devices or maybe similar kinds of devices, but at the, at the same time. In this case, uh, the communications or bookkeeping, what resources and how many resources were allocated already have to be done somehow publicly so that both of the controllers that allocate the resources can access th this data. Consider that uh, the native or original resource driver allocates part of the resources, then the custom resource controller has to know about that decision. And other way around, if the custom controller that is supplement, uh, supplementing the original resource driver controller makes a decision and allocates a bunch of hardware, then the original controller has to know about that decision so that there is no overbooking or a false decision. And there are at least two use cases for these scenarios. One is when you have uh, uh, different kinds of hardware that somehow have to be, for example, um, aligned uh, with the uh, locality, the normal locality or uh, other way, then uh, the controller can consider uh, these resources of uh, different time, for example, uh, a network interface and the GPU adapter and make a decision that uh, these are the hardware that have to be allocated. And uh, this inf information will be later on passed uh, to different Kubelet plugins. Another use case scenario is when you have a similar kind of uh, devices and if uh, the workload doesn't care what kind of or what vendor of the hardware it gets, it's a vendor agnostic, it can deal with any kind of hardware, then uh, there can be a custom uh, controller that uh, can manage all of the vendors' devices in the cluster in this way. So in this case, the allocation would have uh, going would have been going with the different resource class. So naturally, since we have a custom resource uh, driver, uh, then we have a resource class that guides that the resource claim should be forwarded to this new uh, controller, custom controller for the allocation. And uh, when doing the allocation, the custom resource driver controller will make uh, several resource handle entries in the allocation result that is written to the resource claim. And each of these resource handle, resource handle uh, entries will contain a driver name that uh, will be used by the Kubelet to ask the Kubelet plugin to prepare the actual device when the port is going to the node. <coughs> now, another feature that will be coming, hopefully, in 128 is uh, allowing several resource claims that uh, will be used by the same pod and are uh, targeted to the same resource driver. Uh, all of them will be able to be uh, allocated at the same time. So at the moment, uh, the unsuitable nodes call, the one that narrows down the amount of node the main scheduler can use to pick up where on which node the pod should be uh, scheduled on. Uh, this call receives all of the resource claims of particular resource driver at once. So the uh, resource driver that you're building can consider 
uh, the whole amount of the resources that will be used by the pod. But when the allocate call comes to the resource driver, the resource claims are passed at the moment one by one. So that's a, a, a different kind of consideration of resources by the resource driver. And that can bring you to small problems, but like nasty problems. For example, if uh, you have two ports that uh, were deployed simultaneously and they have multiple resource claims, uh, unsuitable nodes will report to the main scheduler that the node A is suitable for both of these pods but when the actual allocate call sequence will start for every single resource claim at some point there might be uh, a resource uh, depletion and uh, the scheduling will have to start all over again so the natural solution for this for this is to uh, make the allocate call to look the same as the unsuitable nodes call so we planning to pass the whole bunch of resource claims for a particular pod so that the allocation call will have a chance to see the whole amount of resources that need to be allocated for a particular pod. And the same problem applies for the Kubelet plugin, especially if uh, the hardware is capable of only handling uh, one entry of the configuration, then uh, for example, virtual functions on some of the SROV capable hardware. Once uh, several virtual functions were provisioned, then the subsequent uh, VFs can only be provisioned when the previously created ones are dismantled. So if your pod has requested two standalone virtual functions, then uh, the unpre uh, unsuitable node call will report that, okay, this GPU on this node seem to be suitable and then uh, allocation and uh, preparation will actually face the situation that uh, the first one has uh, a chance to be created in the SRV capable device but the other one cannot anymore be created because of the hardware limitations. So similar way if we pass all of the resource claims at the same time to not prepare resource and node unprepare resource then it's uh, much easier to bookkeep and uh, handle the resources by the resource driver. So this is what it is now and this is how we think it will gonna be in 128. So this is work ongoing. And yes, thank you. I think we have three minutes for questions. Yeah, so the sorry, the, the question was, is the centralized controller a scheduler plugin? Um, no, it's not. It's its own it's its own entity. It does it, 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 I mean it, you could think of it as a scheduler plugin, but it's not part of the scheduler plugin framework that exists in Kubernetes. It it exists as part of the DRA framework that knows how to communicate with the scheduler via this pod uh, scheduling context object that, that I talked about in the slides earlier. There, there is a scheduler plugin, but it's associated with the DRA framework in general. It's not something that you, as the uh, resource driver developer, need to worry about implementing thing, anything for. Yeah. Um, yeah, and we had a couple of demos that we can show people that are interested after this talk, but we, we ran out of time, so we're not going to be able to, to show them. But if you're interested, please come talk to us after this, and we can uh, go through those with you. Um, are there any other questions? Uh, yep. Um, so if we, uh, if I have like AI ASIC chips, uh, is it possible to do uh, topology aware scheduling, for example, now with the DRE support or something we are looking at uh, in the future? Yeah, so um, currently we haven't thought in detail about, you know, exactly how we're going to enable the whole topology aware or, you know, solve the topology aware problem. 
Um, our kind of default answer at the moment is that if you want to do some sort of alignment, you build a custom controller that knows how to do the alignment for all of the different resources that you know you need to be aligned, right? And because we have this level of indirection where you can have you know, the default drivers for all of your types, and then you just write your custom controller without having to rewrite the kubelet plugin logic, um, it enables you to do this for your custom environments where you know exactly which resources you want to align and can just write that allocation logic rather than all of the prepare and unprepare logic as well. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. In addition, there is uh, another technology just was just released called Node Resource Interface that can help you align uh, what you want, but it's uh, outside of the DRA framework and it's uh, outside of the resource driver. So it's, it's something that resource driver can leverage, but that's uh, another couple of uh, API calls and uh, uh, strictly speaking, it's uh, best effort. So if you're interested in this, uh, the main author and maintainer of DRA framework, uh, Patrick, is going to be at the Intel booth P13. And uh, we have also people there who are involved uh, with the node resource management and the NRI. Come talk to us. Uh, one question. Do you have some recipe how, how uh, this can be it can work together with some legacy device plugins? Uh, what do you mean by work? To, what do you mean by work together? So at least our plan for NVIDIA GPUs mm -hmm. um, with our device plugin is that um, we're going to allow you to, on a node by node basis, decide whether you want to deploy the existing device plugin or the DRA Kubelet plugin, basically. Um, so you know there won't be a mix and match of being able to allocate via both methods on on each node, but at least throughout your cluster you can have some DRA enabled nodes some nodes that are enabled by the existing device plugin so that end users can slowly migrate their applications to using the, the DRA style of asking for resources. Yeah. And there's technical reasons why we can't really do them together on the same node, um, mostly because the device, uh, the device manager within the kubelet, it's the one that does device allocation via the device manager in, or the, 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 the existing device plugin framework. The, the plugins themselves don't do allocation. They just do advertisement of resources. And so we can't coordinate that allocation between our resource driver and DRA and the existing device plugin allocation because we'd have to basically change the kubelet to do that. Okay. Yeah. But otherwise, it's not exclusive. It's not like if you're using um, DRA, the dynamic resource allocation, the rest of the devices of different kind cannot be used in the cluster. They can live inside the same cluster, and some of the hardware can be managed by the device plugins, and some of them can be, as long as they don't conflict. Um, so we need to patch our Kubernetes to at least 128 to use dynamic resource allocation with uh, NVIDIA GPUs, or? Can we use it before with the new me mechanism? Yeah, I mean, officially, you shouldn't be using it until DRA reaches beta, which is going to be at least another couple of releases. But if you want to start prototyping and using it now, 127 is enough. Um, so you can, you know, use 127. There's some feature flags that you'll need to enable um, when you start up your 127 cluster because DRA isn't on by default as an alpha feature. But then you should be able to follow the instructions on our NVIDIA DRA resource driver for GPUs link that's here um, in order to start playing around with it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think this will, this will be the last question. Can this be uh, used in conjunction with the CNI to, for example, allocate a VF to a pod from a DPU? <laughs> yeah, so we have a, um, a separate project going on in, inside NVIDIA for um, doing exactly what you just said. So it's a separate resource driver to our GPU resource driver, but it's allocating VFs for RDMA on DPUs. Yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. right. Right. Yep. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>